don't know me, I'm Mark Heckel. Uh, I'm Master Level USA uh, TF official and Grade 3 referee, Grade 3 field referee. And I've been in the business uh, of officiating for now about 30 years. And what I want to talk about today is uh, safety in the throwing events. This is a very timely topic. I usually like to get out and uh, talk about this um, before the indoor season starts. And unfortunately, it was kind of pushed ahead because of the tragic event that happened up in uh, New York State, up at Cornell, where an official was struck and killed recently. So I think it's something that we all need to, uh, to think about and need to go back and revisit. Uh, even veterans like me who've been around the throws uh, for a very long time need to get back in and take a look at our throw safety procedures, some of the recommendations um, that I'm going to make for you today. And then also get your feedback on, you know, some of the things that you may think of that I haven't thought of that may uh, be pertinent to, you know, throwing safety. I'm not going to deal with jump safety. I'm not going to deal with overall safety. I want to specifically talk about the throws uh, since that is a, cr a critical area and probably the most, um, I don't want to say dangerous because it's not dangerous if you use your head, but the most uh, potentially dangerous area. So I'm going to change the layout here for just a second. And please feel free to and you can jump into that uh, chat pod at any time when you have a question. Um, I also i am going to be going through a PowerPoint, and then I'll, at the end I'll provide you with a copy of this where you can actually download it directly through this meeting if you want to download the entire 50-odd uh, page book uh, that we put together. Uh, as I said, I am a, a grade 3 USA track and field referee. I'm also vice president of the National Throws Coaches Association. I've actually been dealing with uh, throw safety for about the past uh, nine years. Uh, this is, uh, as a thrower, this is something I'm uh, very much uh, concerned about because I don't want to see us lose the throws uh, at the, uh, the high school level or at the collegiate level. We already are down to just a handful of states that still throw the javelin, and we're down to one or two states that still allow the hammer to be contested at the high school level, and we don't, you know, we Certainly, there's a push to um, get more states involved with the hammer, and we also want to preserve those states that are already throwing the jam. So we want to make sure that we're doing everything we can to, to mitigate as much as we can the potential for accidents and the potential for injuries or, and, uh, God forbid, any fatalities uh, in the throwing events. So as I say, if you have a question as we go, please uh, drop that in and go ahead and type into the chat pod. I'll be watching that. And uh, with that, let's get started. So, uh, very simple, basic thing. Rule number one, never turn your back to the circular runway. I know that sounds insanely simple, and you would think, well, everybody would know that, but you would be surprised at the number of officials, especially if they're not certified officials, and even the number of certified officials who may have never worked the throws. They don't think about this. But rule number one is never turn your back, even if you know that the thrower in the circle is a world-class athlete um, and uh, you have no quote-unquote fear of them, you know that they know what they're doing and that they're going to be uh, under control, you never know when a, wire, a hammer wire can break, when discus can slip out of a hand, when any other number of things can happen. So our, our hard and fast rule that we, we discuss all the time in the throws is rule number one, never turn your back to the circle or runway. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to break this down into uh, each of the, the uh, four major events, the shot, the discus, the hammer and weight I'm going to combine, and the javelin. And we're going to look at some things that as officials we need to consider when we get started. So let's first start with a shot. And one of the things we want to do is we want to go through an inspection routine and make this routine as we're approaching the shot venue. Uh, so we want to look at, at the surface of the ring, and especially if you have a sunken ring, there may be times when there may be uh, Part of the ring may have come loose from the concrete uh, if there's a metal insert or the metal insert itself could be uh, dented or there may be some protrusions there that the athlete could come in contact with um, where they could lose their balance potentially fall and injure them and remember it's not just about our safety it's not just about the safety of the, the spectators but it's also about the safety of the athletes so we want to make sure that we're doing uh, the best we can to look at different things and to make sure that the venue is safe as well Make sure it's swept free of any grass, dirt, other material that can affect traction in the competitor's shoes. Uh, the, old, the question always comes up in regard to wet circles. 
Most athletes will tell you, and, and I agree as a thrower and as an official, that a flooded ring is better than a dry and muddy, than a, a damp and muddy ring. Uh, athletes actually get better traction. <laughs> the shoes have a tendency to get better traction in a flooded ring than they do in one that has been swept and now there's mud being tracked in there uh, or whatever else. So as much as we can, we want to make sure it's, it's swept if, if we can. Uh, if, but if you have wet conditions, it's better just to leave it wet and, and actually flooded because uh, the athletes will actually get better traction and are less likely um, to become injured. Uh, also make sure that the area is flagged off. A lot of times what I'll do is I'll throw, uh, I will take a bunch of uh, caution tape with me. I'll take a couple of rolls of caution tape with me. I know a friend of mine uses rope and he has some stakes that he takes along. And what we'll do is we'll flag off and we're going to partition that area so that non-competitors don't wander in there. Now, especially indoors, this always seems to be a problem because you'll have athletes who aren't aware that the weight is being thrown in that particular end of the, of the venue where the shot's being thrown. And they're warming up or they're jogging or they're whatever and they cross through that area and I've seen far too many near misses. Um, but you want to make sure that that's cordoned off. Uh, and you want to make that, that safety zone, that flag zone, about as wide as you can make it. Now, the NCAA, uh, several years ago, came out with a 45 degree safety section. I'd like to expand that to 60 degrees. And we'll talk about that a little bit later when we take a look at the diagram. Uh, but I'd like to make it as wide as I can possibly make it to really control that because you don't know, especially indoors, when you have athletes who, you know, are just starting the season or they're just, they're freshmen and they're throwing the weight and they don't know a lot about throwing the weight. Uh, and maybe the cage isn't the greatest cage. We'll talk a little bit about that when we get to the weight and hammer. But I want to make sure I have plenty of room. I want to have a nice big safety zone to make sure that we're not endangering anybody uh, who may inadvertently walk through there or who may not be paying attention. Uh, we also want to make sure the shot if we're outdoors, um, we want to make sure there aren't any divots because I don't want to step in a divot and twist my ankle. I don't want to get hurt. Uh, I also don't want to allow any foreigners uh, or any, anything foreign in the impact area itself um, that may cause the shot to bounce. Now, this isn't such a, a big deal indoors, but certainly it is outdoors. So we want to make sure that that landing area is relatively smooth and that we're not, we don't have anything else out there that potentially a shot could bounce and ricochet and possibly ricochet into um, one of the officials or one of the helpers who may be retrieving it once that kind of thing. Um, you also want to be careful of large stones. If you have a very stony area, a very stony impact area, the smaller shots, especially the 4Ks and later, if you're doing a master's competition, they have a tendency to bounce a little bit easier and, and ricochet which may cause a problem. Uh, and, and again, about the divots. Make sure that they're, they're stepped in or that they're filled in in some way. Um, the same thing when you take the shot out. If you're on a grass, for instance, if the impact area is grass, make sure that you step that divot back in or that somebody steps that divot back in so that there isn't the potential for tripping and falling. Some considerations when uh, the competition has started. When the circle's closed, put a cone in the center. And that's it. It's not available for warm-up. It's not available for practice. You're in charge of that. As the throws official, it's your job and your responsibility to make sure that, that, that you control the environment. Okay? Uh, and don't allow unsafe, uh, any kind of unsafe uh, conditions to occur. If you have a situation where you have um, dirt or you have a muddy area to get into the circle, See if you can get meat management to provide some plywood sheets to lay down so that the athletes can cross and you can cross if you're using tape to measure so that you can, the athlete can cross the plywood to get to the circle and not have to go through the mud and then try to scrape it off on the area outside the circle or on towels or whatever else. And we'll talk about the equipment in just a second. Um, if at all possible, ask meat management to do any mowing. They're going to do at least a couple days in advance and to clear the grass clippings from around the circle because you get grass clippings and it gets wet, you start, you know, the athlete starts slipping and so on. Um, don't allow the athlete to warm up anywhere outside the circle. Now this is always a problem because the athlete, you know, they want to have their, their implement and they want to go off over here and they want to, you know, do a little practice and, and that kind of thing. 
No. Okay, unless you have a designated area, like another circle, a warm-up area, that's supervised by another official or uh, a coach or at the high school level by an adult. So that's regulated and, take, and, and supervised. Um, but they should never be taking any warm-ups in or near the impact area because they're not going to be paying attention. They're warming up or whatever, and they're not paying attention to what's actually happening in the circle. Uh, again, when possible, get me management to put up physical obstructions, some kind of physical obstruction, uh, stakes with rope or caution tape or uh, heavy barriers if it's indoors. And, and also make sure that there, there's a stop barrier uh, for the shot, uh, particularly indoors because it'll, have tens, it'll hit and it'll, it'll roll, and it may roll from one end of the, the arena to the other. Uh, so again, you want to make sure and control that environment as much as, we, uh, as, much as you can. And then also go back and refer to those inspection guidelines. So every venue is different. Even if you've worked the same venue 10 times in the last year, every venue will be different every time you're there. Uh, so you know, never take anything for granted. Oh, well, it's the same as it was last week. Uh, basic supplies you should have, a broom and or a squeegee. Uh, if it's a light rain, you know, and you've got to use your judgment here and listen to the athletes as well. You should have a broom or a squeegee with you to make sure that you're, you're taking care or you're watching um, the condition of the ring. Towels, not only for shoes, but also for the shots. Uh, the athletes usually will probably bring their own, but you want to have some extras on hand as well. Uh, leaf blower, especially if you're outdoors, is a very fast, very effective way to clear the circle, water, leaves, grass clippings, whatever else. Um, so if meat management doesn't have one, I know a lot, lots of us, uh, who are throws officials if we're going to be, know we're going to be uh, in an outdoor venue and we may have rain or whatever else, we'll bring our own leaf blower uh, and just have it sitting there. So if we have to clear um, we have to clear the circle, we'll go ahead and use a leaf blower. A broom will work just fine. A broom will work fine. But we want to make sure that if we have, a, especially if it's water, we're trying to clear the circle, we've had a rain shower and it looks like it's going to clear off and we want to clear it out and let it dry out, the leaf blower works very effectively. Steel rake, especially if the impact area is dirt or gravel or some other material other than grass, the steel rake will really help to level out the divots, keep you a nice level impact area, and um, therefore keep it a lot safer for you, but also it's, it's easier to mark, okay? Um, because if you have an, you know, if you're as an official and you want to move in, you want to get the mark, and you've got two that are, that are pretty close to each other, which one was there first? Well, if I've raked it out after each throw, and you can have one official who does nothing more than just rake. Now, sometimes if you're thin, if your crew is rather thin, you'll rake out after each round. That's fine too. But if you can rake out after each after each throw, you know, just a real quick little rake, or even with your foot, and just rake and cover up that divot, makes it easier to mark. Plus, it'll keep it smooth, and you're less likely to trip over that particular divot. One of the things we look at then, or that we recommend at the NTCA is we have safety zones. You'll see the dark red, and you'll see the dark red zone. Uh, that is the most, the area where you're most likely uh, to get uh, hit by an implement to, to be struck. And that basically is inside the sector. The light red zone that you'll see on either side, uh, that is our next danger zone, and that would be uh, roughly that 60 degree arc, or 45 degree arc in the NCA. Uh, that's most likely to be the closed fouls that'll come out either side. We then uh, set off what we call a yellow zone from the middle of the circle forward. There is potential that, yes, you could get hit, especially on a stray throw where an athlete may lose control uh, and throw uh, the implement uh, far to the outside. Uh, I recall uh, many years ago we had an athlete, I was down at uh, College of Women Mary, and there was a there were a set of archways over here, uh, over to the right. If I can grab the right tool, there we go. That's the tool I wanted. And there were a set of arch archways over here on the right-hand side, and the athlete was a rotational thrower, and there was a woman sitting, we'll say, about here. And what happened was, is he lost control of the shot as he came through, and he literally threw the shot this direction. Now, luckily, somebody yelled, the woman ducked, and the shot 
it was a 16 pound shot rolled down her back. Had she not ducked, she probably would have been hit full on in the face, and that certainly would not be what we would want to happen. So you want to make sure that everything from the midline forward is potentially dangerous. Okay, there is always a risk that, that you'll be hit. And basically the green zone is from the middle of the circle back. Rarely have I seen an athlete lose control and lose the shot out the back half of the circle, although, yes, it can happen. Uh, I have personally never seen that happen, but I have seen uh, many uh, officials or whatever get hit out in this area on either side because, number one, they violated rule number one, they turned their back to the circle, but also because there is potential, especially with rotational throwers, that there is a potential they will lose the shot out to that side, you know, out to one side or the other. So you really have to be aware of that. You have to be cognizant of that. Any questions about the shot? All right, let's move over and talk a little bit about the discus. Again, the inspection routine pretty much the same as far as making sure it's smooth, making sure there are no indentations in the ring, making sure it's swept. Um, and again, not allowing any foreign objects, you know, as much as possible in uh, in the sector. Now, we have to be even more particular with the discus, uh, especially here in uh, point number three, where we, we talk about uh, wet grass, okay? The discus will skid, so we have to be much more aware of that, that working in an environment where there's wet, wet grass uh, because we've had a rain shower or maybe it is raining, we have to be aware that the discus is going to hit and skid. We also have to be aware that if we're not wearing the proper footwear for that particular situation, we might <laughs> we might hit and skid uh, for some distance. I know, uh, as Mike McCoy can verify, you know, we've worked events where it has been very wet. And we've been lucky to be able to move out in the impact area because of the amount of um, you know, wetness on the grass. So as part of that inspection routine, you, you also want to be conscious of what the condition of the grass is for the discus in the impact area because the discus may hit and skid. Uh, it also, if it, the ground is very hard, uh, it will have a tendency to skip. So it will hit and it will skip up. Uh, we had an official several years ago at our state chain, our high school state meet who actually broke his leg, broke his lower leg because the discus skipped and uh, hit him right on the shin and broke his leg. Uh, and that was only a, you know, a 1.6K uh, high school discus. So you can imagine when a 2K discus thrown by a, uh, a national or world-class athlete, what kind of damage they could do uh, if that were to happen. So now the age comes into play, okay? Uh, if this is, if, if you work uh, regularly at a, a certain venue, you really should inspect that cage. Uh, and hopefully meat management is doing this. But you need to take a look at that cage and see if, if there's anything, there may be any holes or any tears. Um, and, and look at the, the netting and look at the supports itself. Uh, one of the big things that we talk about is we, we talk about the slack. Several years ago, there was a hammer thrower who uh, released a, an implement early. It, hit, it went into the cage, but the cage was so tight, uh, we, I always refer to it as being banjo string tight, that the implement hit, rebounded, and actually hit him in the face. Uh, he survived, but uh, you can imagine uh, you know, an implement having that trampoline effect of hitting the cage and bouncing back at him uh, at you know, not a whole lot less than the speed at which he released it, you know, that could be potentially fatal. So what you want to do, what we recommend is you want to go in and you want to pull on the netting, okay, with a good amount of force. Um, I'm a big guy, I'm, you know, 280, so it's very easy, me, <laughs> very easy for me to pull on a cage. But what you want to do is you want to pull and see on how much it'll flex. You want it to flex somewhat. I mean, you don't want it to be so flexible that, you know, it's just, like leaves blowing in the wind. But you want to pull on it uh, well to see how far it is, it, it'll displace toward the outside. And then what we recommend is go back another three feet from that. And if you have some, uh, I now carry cans of uh, um, marking spray, 
And what I'll do is I'll actually I'll, I'll pull the cage out and say, okay, it's going to come here to point X. So I'll go three feet out from that. And then I'm actually going to put a line down. And I'm going to say, okay, this is the this is as close as I want any official to be in to be to that cage, because if an implement does come out and push that back, I still have a buffer zone of about three feet to keep me or any other any other official from getting hit. Uh, the late Ernie Sites one year thought he was fine. He was down at uh, Meade University of Pennsylvania, and an implement uh, he was standing too close to the cage. The implement came out, hit the cage hit the netting and pushed it out far enough and actually hit Ernie in the jaw. Now, he wasn't seriously injured, but we don't want to see anybody get injured, whether it be uh, lightly or severely. Um, that also makes it very clear that this is a potential danger area. So you won't have uh, another official or an athlete or a coach or whomever trying to come up there and go inside that, that perimeter. The other thing that you have to remember about cages, and especially here in the discus, and more importantly, in the hammer, the cage is not intended to stop the implement. The intent of the cage is merely to make to, to dissipate the energy of the implement as it's released. Okay, so don't rely on the fact that the cage is there. That oh, what's going to stop it? Uh, a couple of years ago at Penn Relays, we had a hammer come through a hole in the cage. Actually, blew through the cage, uh, stretched the the, uh, the netting came through the cage, fortunately reduced enough energy, but dropped straight down and nearly hit uh, one of my electronic measurement operators. So never assume that the cage is going to stop everything. As far as your uh, considerations go, again, control the circle. When the competition is done and there's nothing else that day or there's no event following that, close the doors. And if you can, secure them so that, hey, we're done. There's not going to be anything else here. You also have to, with the discus, you have to be conscious of wind. You know, and remember that the winds at a loft are, can be very different from the winds at ground level. They can be blowing a different direction. They can be swirling at ground level. They can be blowing directly one direction um, uh, off. So you've got to be conscious of that because the discus is more susceptible to wind than probably any of the other implements. It'll get blown around pretty easily. The javelin gets blown around pretty easily as well. Make sure that all the implements are carried back. The big idea, or the the most common thing that people want to do here is they want to you know they'll toss the discus out to the side or out of the sector and allow the athletes to come out and get them, or they'll toss them out you know to another official who may toss them back or whatever. No, carry them, carry them. That way you eliminate any potential problems where you it may slip out of your hand as you're tossing it out. To the sector, you know, out of the sector to the side. Just carry them and be done with it. And don't even play around. Supplies, again, broom squeegees, towels, a leaf blower. Okay, and again, that leaf blower can be very effective as well. And we'll take a look at our safety zone. Um, this is looking at a, at a combined circle where you have a hammer circle and a discus circle uh, inside a cage. And basically, the reason that we have a yellow zone all around, there really is no green zone here. That yellow zone, you never know. The implement can come out, you know, it can penetrate through there, it'll dissipate a lot of energy, it'll lose a lot of energy as it comes out, as it comes through the cage and maybe hits a pole or whatever else. But basically, you, you've got to stay alert when you're around the discus cage. You'll see our light red area uh, is basically a box, and the box is, uh, you know, varies on how much how much uh, give, how much play there is in the cage. You can also see that we have a dark red area. We have a high danger area right around the perimeter of the cage because, again, the netting can uh, can be hit and move out and potentially strike somebody. So we want to make sure that we have a perimeter there where we don't want, you know, we want no, everyone to stay out of it. That's no man's land. The same way as anything in the sector would be no man's land. big key, too, with the discus is you can set the doors and you can leave them. You can also set the doors, you know, and you can adjust the doors, whether it be a left-handed or right, uh, left or right-handed thrower. I would recommend that if you can, use the doors the way they're intended to be used, so adjust them for the thrower, whether they be left or right. Uh, but again, uh, in this instance, if you have a right-handed thrower and this backside door is closed, remember that the discus can hit the door, could hit the door, 
and ricochet out this way, then that could create a potential hazard. So you want to make sure that when you're, when you're thinking of athlete control, you really don't want your athletes out in this area. You want to put your athlete bench somewhere back in here, in this area, so that they're out of the way and less likely to get hit. Okay? And again, some of that is dictated by the facility, but a lot of it is dictated by you as the official. So you can set those parameters and say, well, no, I want, I don't want that. I want this person over here and uh, you know, bench here and so on. Uh, there are also maybe other obstacles you've got to be aware of that might be sitting out on either side. So you may have over here, uh, for instance, the old discus circle at Penn Relays. <clears throat> this was a fence, uh, and this was the was the baseball field over here, and then over here on this side we had uh, train tracks. So you've got to be careful and be aware of all of those areas as well. Let's move on to the hammer and weight, and this one has come into particular has come into particular focus, especially with the uh, the tragedy up in Cornell. Um, one of the things, a couple of things I want to point out here is you can see there in blue under under one one. Never throw the weighter hammer from a shot circle when the tow board is still there. I don't care if it's warm ups. I don't care what it is. Until if if it's a combination shot weight circle uh, or shot hammer circle, you take the tow board off. The last thing you need is for an athlete who's doing turns to come up. They turn. Their foot catches the end of the t the edge of the tow board. They now have lost control of the implement. They also are in a position where they may break an ankle by tripping over the tow board. So never, ever allow anything to be done, uh, uh, any throws uh, of the, the weighter hammer when the tow board is still in place. If it's there, you know, find a, you know, get a, a wrench or get maintenance or get meat management to get there and take the thing off. Um, the other one, too, uh, if we look down here under number four, um, you also want to make officials, workers, others aware of wet grass will cause the hammer to skid. Hammers will skid. They will also plug. Okay? More than likely when it's really wet, if the ground is soft, they'll plug. But if the ground is uh, fairly hard and you're just getting a, a rain shower, the hammer will hit and skid. So you want to be careful of that. And remember, it's we're not so much, well, we are concerned with the head of the hammer. But remember, the wire is just as dangerous. So the wire spinning around you know, the head of the hammer as it's in flight, or even once it hits, the wire can come up and, and do a pretty nasty job gashing into your flesh if you're not careful. Um, you also want to be careful because very hard ground will cause the hammer to bounce. And again, depending on how it hits, depending on how hard it is, and how it bounces, and the wire, uh, it may bounce in an unknown direction. It may be totally out of control. So you really have to be careful out in the sector. Uh, another thing you need to be aware of, if you're in 1992 in New Orleans at the Olympic trials, the hammer was actually thrown on artificial turf. Uh, they threw it into Lane Stadium. And I remember uh, watching my good buddy Judd Logan uh, throw. It hit on the turf. They had... 10-foot high cyclone fence set well back behind the sector. Judd actually, uh, it landed on the turf. It bounced over the cyclone fence, the temporary cyclone fence. It bounced on the second or third lane of the track and then proceeded to bounce into the stands. So you've really got to be aware of, your, of the facility and any of those types of hazards that you may not normally think of. Uh, I always like, as a referee, I like to go out and do a walk around the day before and then I'll do another walk around of all the venues I'm responsible for the day of, a good hour before the first event even starts, before the, before the crew even gets there. I'll go out and do a walk around to make sure that everything looks right and we don't have any potential danger issues. Uh, again, looking at the cage and the netting uh, has to be a, a absolute part of what you do. Um, if you run into one of these cyclone fence cages, the wire cages, they're problematic because they will have that trampoline effect. Okay, they, the, the, the net cages are nice because they absorb the energy, but the, uh, the cyclone fence or the, the, the wire uh, fencing really doesn't absorb it, and they're going to be 
it's going to be a trampoline. Um, if you have the double layer cage, make sure that those double layers are at least two feet apart. That way it hits one, it dissipates, it hits the, the other one, it dissipates even more. Or if it happens to break through the, the first layer, hopefully the second layer will help it to dissipate even more. Okay? Check the doors and make sure they work. If the doors aren't operable, if you can't move them, then go to meet management and say, hey, I need these doors to work. I need them to be able to move. Because for safety purposes, I have to be able to make them move. This is particularly important if the venue is inside the perimeter of the track or if you're indoors in the weight. Okay? Uh, unless you're completely segregated to the point where you don't need the doors, you're off in a corner of the field house or a corner of the arena. Uh, much as uh, we would see at Cornell or at Army uh, or at Navy, those types of, of venues. What you want to make sure that the doors work. Okay? Uh, tell me management, they've got to watch the netting. Netting on outdoor cages deteriorates a lot faster than on indoor cages. Yes, it should be inspected every year, whether it's indoors or outdoors, whether it's a weight cage or a hammer cage outdoors. But outdoor cages deteriorate a lot more quickly because most of the time they're not taken down and they're not stored over the winter, uh, which is very hard on the netting, causes it to become more brittle, more frail, and that leads to potentially more accidents outdoors. Um, inspect the implement. Okay, if you look at the harness, uh, and it, it, this is assuming that you don't already have a Weights and Measures uh, team or Weights and Measures inspector who's already gone through this. Uh, but make sure that, that, that the weight particularly is, is in good shape. Um, you want to make, check the harness, look for torn straps or worn straps or frayed straps. They potentially can burst, allowing the ball inside to come out. We don't want that to happen. Make sure that um, there's no duct tape, athletic tape, electrical tape. Those are not manufacturer supplied. If those are on the implement, then it's considered to be homemade. It's illegal. If taking those off exposes a problem, like the core is gone or the, the plug is gone and it's leaking, throw it out. You also want to inspect the handle to make sure there are no cracks in the handle, no burrs. Uh, I've seen handles literally blow apart uh, because there was a crack in the handle. And when it hit the ground or even from the torque of the thrower, especially among elite throwers, the, the the handle is literally separated, and then the, the implement's going one way, the athlete's going a, a different direction, uh, and both potentially dangerous. Uh, in the hammer, if you, again, if you don't have inspection, or if you don't have a, a separate weights and measures team, tape the ends of the wire. So when the, the wire goes through the eyelet and the handle and is, is wrapped, tape that end so it doesn't get hung up in the cage. So if they do hit the cage, it's not going to hang on that wire. We've had, I've been in far too many competitions where the hammer has hung up in the netting. We want it to hit and slide out. Okay, so look for that. Also look for any nicks or kinks in the wire um, because that may cause them to fail. Especially if the wires have been, been bent uh, at a 90 degree uh, angle. That wire is pretty much compromised. And if necessary, excuse me, if necessary, Go to the athlete, go to the coach, and say, hey, you know, you really need to replace this wire because there's, a, there's potential here that this may break and cause harm to either you or uh, you, the athlete, uh, or to anybody else around the circle. Normal considerations, you keep everybody out of the sector. Okay? Remember, the netting is used to, to retard or dissipate the momentum of the ball, not stop it. You can still penetrate the netting. Uh, broken hammer wire can penetrate the netting very easily. Make sure there's enough slack. Okay, and again, go through that same process that we talked about uh, in the discus. Um, and remember that warm up with influence doesn't begin until you're there. Okay, nothing happens until you're ready and you've you know done your job as an official to make sure that everything is safe and you've made it. You've done all the risk mitigation that you can possibly do, then you allow for warm-up. 
some other things. If the implement comes in contact with a hard surface, it hits a pole, hits the concrete, uh, hits any other hard surface, check it out. Make sure that it's not damaged. If it is damaged, take it out of play. If it appears fine, no problem. Uh, depending on the number of throwers, number of implements, you also want to consider using salvo throwing or salvo warm-up. Uh, let's just say that we have five implements, ten throwers. So we're going to have the first five throw. They're going to wait by the cage after they're done throwing. And then when the fifth thrower is thrown, they all go get theirs. Okay, and no one's throwing. No one's in the circle. No one's doing anything. They're going to go out and get the implements. They're going to bring them back. And then the next five. And then we repeat this process. Some people say it's a little slower. Uh, it is because you're waiting you to, to allow them to go out and get the implements. And this is particularly true if you have a, if you're, you have a thin crew. Uh, I'm not talking a national championship level. I'm talking a collegiate dual meet. You may only have a couple of officials, so you want to use your resources the best you can. Okay? Salvo throwing or salvo warm-ups are a great way to do that. Uh, never uh, let, uh, allow them to have unsupervised warm-ups. You, and I've been called in three separate cases uh, as a, uh, an expert witness, you may be liable for negligence if you allow the athlete to warm up outside of direct supervision. Yes, you may be liable, okay? Because you have that, quote, color authority as a, uh, an official that you're supposed to be regulating things. So you may be liable. Uh, you might want to consider private liability insurance. You also might want to uh, talk with your attorney or consult with your state on how they view negligence and reasonable care. I'm not going to go into the legalese. I'm not an attorney. Did not sleep at the Holiday Inn last night. Um, so you might want to take a look uh, and get an understanding of what negligence is in your state and what reasonable care is considered to be in your state as well. You close the circle, you close the circle. Uh, during warm-ups, put an official at the cage door to regulate the entry of athletes. Okay? That person is your, your, your RSO, your range safety officer. They control the flow of what happens at the circle. And you've got to be observant of officials in the impact area, give them enough time to retrieve the implement, get it out of the impact area, and then they allow the next athlete in to warm up. At Penn, relays, we're very conscious of this, and we have one person assigned for each event, and the hammer and discus, we have one person assigned who does nothing but regulate the door. That's our RSO, and that is their specific job as they regulate that warm-up so that no one goes into the circle until the area is you know, until it's safe for them to do so. Uh, and we make sure that everyone is out of the sector or, or is at least in the safe area uh, where we can go ahead and continue with the warm-up. Again, close the doors if you can. Carry the implements back. I don't know many people who are going to throw back a weight or a hammer. Uh, there is a tendency with the women's hammer because of its lightness to do that. Uh, again, about the mowing. And don't allow the athletes or, or coaches into the impact area during warm-ups. Just say, no, you're not going that. We'll, we'll handle it. The tendency of the athlete is because they're used to it in practice, they'll throw and then they'll go out and get it. No. When you're in competition, you take care of that. You and your crew take care of that. You don't let the athlete out there. You don't let the coach out there. Okay? Uh, supplies. Yeah. Brooms, squeegee, towels, leaf blower. Uh, if you can get meat management or someone else to provide some extra hammer wires, uh, tape for securing the hammer wire ends if there is no uh, implement inspection. Uh, you also might want to have gloves for your own hands, especially if you're going to be dragging the, uh, the implements uh, back uh, into the sector. Or, I'm sorry, back out of the sector, uh, out to the safe zone and back to the uh, back to the circle. So you may want to have some gloves there. Uh, and again, the layout pretty much this is exactly the same uh, for the discus. Uh, but it was for the discus. is exactly the same here for the hammer. Again, there really is no, sa is no truly safe zone. Uh, safe, perhaps. Perhaps we could consider this area back here around the back of the cage to be somewhat of a safe zone because the probability that a hammer will break and uh, fly out through that area is, is pretty low. Most of the time, if a wire breaks during turning for a 
right-handed thrower. The uh, implement is going to come out this way. For a left-handed thrower, it would have a tendency to come out this way. It'll move away at a tangent to the line of throwing. So this area back in here is probably the safest, if there is any safe area around the hammer. Around the hammer. Lastly, let's take a look at the javelin in the few minutes we have remaining. Again, much of this is the same. Okay. The big thing here with grass, if you're throwing on grass, you may need to look at the approach and where the arc is laid out to make sure that it's safe. A grass, some people refer to it as a pit, but if the grass pit is relatively worn, uh, it's potentially dangerous. You may have, uh, you know, a thrower can slip or they could plant and, and not rotate. They could plant and, uh, you know, blow up a knee or blow up an ankle. Uh, if you are on an all-surface runway, again, make sure it's, it's clear. And again, the wet, the, the wet grass is also a consideration as well in the landing area. You also have to make sure, uh, when you look at the implement, make sure the grip isn't uh, worn or frayed. Again, if you don't have inspection, look for cracks and breaks in the body that may cause the javelin to break while it's in the air. Uh, make sure the head's fastened to the javelin. Yes, I have seen javelins where the head was not secured to the body of the javelin. So these are all things you can look at, and you can also have your crew look at as they're retrieving the implements and bringing them back into the runway. Again, always carry them back. And if you're, when you carry them back, I know it says it should always be carried in a container. That's getting them to the, to the venue. Um, but when you're bringing them back, you should carry them with the point down so that the implement is perpendicular to the ground as much as possible. You don't want to wind up inadvertently jabbing somebody or sticking the tail into someone or having them approach you from behind and you're not aware that you're there and you inadvertently uh, impale them with the javelin. So make sure you carry the javelin with the point down. Our considerations, again, pretty much the same as all the others, including, you know, salvo throwing. The other big thing, too, wind. As we said with the discus, wind is a big factor in the javelin. So make sure you're looking at the wind conditions to see if there's a potential that if someone, even if they throw it down in the middle of the sector, that it could blow well to the left or well to the right, uh, where people may be, uh, you may have unsuspecting folks uh, who are not really paying attention, and the wind could blow the javelin off to one side or the other. There was a, an incident uh, several years ago at an international meet, I believe, in France, or somewhere in Europe, where a javelin thrower um, throwing, the wind caught the javelin and actually blew it over onto the long jump runway and hit uh, a competitor in the long jump. So you really want to be conscious of that, and if you have to, you know, you need to slow things down, or you need to use, uh, some places they'll use a, an air horn to let everybody know, hey, you know, there's somebody getting ready to throw, uh, we'll blast the air horn so that now you know to be on uh, the lookout for an implement, that, uh, a javelin that may be coming out here. Uh, again, never allow the unsupervised warm-ups. Uh, officials, same thing for all of these. Um, one here, the second bullet point, after each throw, whether using tape or electronic measurement, stand in the middle of the runway to obstruct the next competitor. If you have a flight coordinator, that's what they should be doing. A flight coordinator, as soon as the athlete starts down the runway, so Mike McCoy starts down the runway to make his attempt, and on the flight coordinator, I'm stepping onto the runway to make sure that no one, that no other uh, athlete, no other competitor tries to step on there and say, okay, I'm going next. No. The flight coordinator runs that. If there is no flight coordinator, if you're just running a you know, real simple operation, then you as the chief or whoever is uh, reading the measurements at, at the tow board, you step out onto the arc and you don't allow anything to happen until... The implement lands and it's cleared and you, you know, you've done your, uh, your measurement and everything's kosher and then you step back off the runway and now the next competitor can go. So the flight coordinator, if there is one, should be doing this. If not, you should be doing it as the chief or whoever is actually uh, at the board. should be the one who's uh, regulating that. Again, the same competition uh, considerations. The big one here is that fourth point down when athletes want to perform the pick warm-up. When 
each of these short five to ten meter throws. Uh, what we recommend is you collect everybody together who wants to pick. You set up a, a pick line and you work down the you work down the field and then you work back. No one advances to get their jail until everybody's picked. And you keep try and keep the group together. You try to keep them all uh, roughly in the same line. You can, and depending on how many throws you have, you know, if you've got 15, then you just work down the sector. You turn around and you come back. If you have you know, five or six, work down one side, work across, work back. But again, keeping everybody together and paying very close attention to what's going on. Nobody throws bombs. These are the short short little pick throws, uh, and everybody stays together. So if somebody wants to drop out, fine. They drop out, they walk back. No throwing on the way back. They just take their implement and they walk back. Otherwise, everybody stays together. And if you have to do two groups, say you have a large group with perhaps multi-eventers, and half of them are ready, okay, fine. Take them out, let them pick. The other group is... You know, and once you're halfway, you know, if you're halfway down the field and somebody decides, oh, wait, I want to, I want to, no, you'll wait for the next group. Okay? You dictate that, not the athlete. Supplies, broom squeegee, uh, I should say runways, not circles, uh, towels, a leaf blower. These are the things you just need for the safety aspect of matters. And we'll take a look here at our diagram. And we can see that pretty much anything inside the sector we consider the, the most dangerous area. Anything behind the tow board, behind the arc, really is a, a real is a safe area. We really don't have to worry a whole lot about uh, what's going to transpire back there. Uh, and again, widening our sector as we go out into the uh, the uh, light red zone, and also then in the yellow zone, because again, wind can play a factor in how it pushes the implement around. Other considerations, and these are going to get, these have a lot to do with safety, they have nothing to do with the actual events or the actual implements. Um, what are your limitations? And I think we have to, we have to do this as individuals, but we also have to do this uh, as uh, chiefs, and we have to look at our crew and say, well, what are the limitations of my crew? I may have somebody who's a very good official, an excellent official, but they're not mobile. They can't, they can't get out there. But we have to look at our own limitations and say, hey, I really can't get out there. Okay? The second point to that, uh, how do your limitations or the, limit, the limitations of your, your crew affect the safety of yourself and others? I don't know all the particulars of the incident that happened in Cornell, but unfortunately it, it appears from what I've read, and I'm only going on what I've read and what I've heard, um, that gentleman at age 75 was not the most mobile. Maybe perhaps should not have been inside the cage. Perhaps he should have you know, had some other role in that event. Uh, I don't know. I, I've heard conflicting stories. I don't know. But we have to take that into consideration. How, does, how do these limitations, whether they be your own personal limitations or the limitations of a member of your crew, how do they affect the safety of both the individual and others. Because remember, too, when an, when an athlete throws an implement, and unfortunately it leads to an injury or even death, that affects the athlete as well. It not only affects them competitively, but it, it affects them as a person. We have to be aware and conscious of that as well. And the third consideration, should you be in the impact area? This is one, I, there, there's a physical limitation of whether you should be in the impact area. There's also an open debate, uh, has been an open debate for a long time, as to uh, should officials be in the impact area during a throw, or should they be outside the uh, outside the sector, and then once the implement lands, you know, then move in uh, with the, uh, the prism stick or with the tape stick, and, and then mark uh, where the implement landed. I'm a firm believer of working inside the circle. Or, I'm sorry, yeah, not inside the circle, excuse me, working inside the impact area. Uh, you can get to the mark quickly. You can also get to the mark safely if you watch where the implement goes. You have to be cognizant of where the implement is, whether it's a left-handed thrower or right-handed thrower. For instance, in the, in the discus, if I'm in the sector and a 
uh, right hander is throwing, the tendency is the discus will move to my right. So it'll come out, it may curl, but it'll curl to my right. It rarely, if ever, will go to the left. It's also a good thing during warm-ups, look at where the throwers are throwing. You can get a good feeling for where they're going to be by the way they warm up. Because they'll have a, if they have a tendency to warm up throwing to the right side of the sector, they'll probably throw to the right side of the sector during competition. So just watch and pick up on where they're going and just keep mental note of that so that you're in position and you are also, are also in a safe position to not get hit. Okay, I'm going to change layouts one more time. In the upper left-hand corner, you should see a pod that says File Share. That is the Throw Safety Handbook. It is a PDF. You are more than welcome to download it. All you have to do is click on it. And then once you do, it will say Download Files. And then you can go ahead and click on Download Files. And you can download that as a 50-some-odd uh, page. Uh, manual that we have put together, much more detailed than what this presentation is, uh, but it is free for you to use. It is also free for you to distribute. We is, we only ask, the NTCA only asks that you distribute it in its entirety uh, with the citations and everything in place. That's the only thing that we ask. There's no charge for that. Any questions before we wrap up? But We have about seven minutes. I'll be more than happy to answer any questions you may have. Even those of you who are just listening, you're allowed to ask questions as well. And just feel free to uh, go ahead and type them into the chat box. Oh, my buddy Chris Teagarden. Thanks, Chris. Appreciate it. Any other questions from anyone? Well, seeing none, I thanks everybody for coming today. And uh, again, throw safety, it's an all-the-time thing. It is an all-the-time thing. And, you know, we really want to make sure that we're safe out there. We want to make sure that our athletes are safe. We want to make sure that the spectators and the coaches are safe as well. So go ahead and download that handbook. And again, you can distribute that freely. Uh, we just ask you to distribute it, uh, you know, the way it is. Uh, but it's, it's a resource for you to use. And hopefully we're not going to see any more see as few near misses as possible, let alone any more injuries or, God forbid, any more deaths. Uh, but it is, uh, if you have any questions, please feel free to contact me. Um, uh, safety has, has been my thing for quite a while, uh, and I'm, uh, you know, I very much want to make sure that, that we're doing everything that we can to uh, keep the throws safe, to keep our athletes and everyone else, and especially us as officials, to make sure that we're safe and that we can provide the best job possible for our athletes. So thanks very much from a, a snowy, now sounds like rainy, Central PA. Enjoy the rest of your day, and uh, we're done in time for football.